There are many demonstrations I like to use when I'm dealing with gases, but it goes back for this one to my basic philosophy of teaching chemistry. I give my students CPR. I teach them the chemistry. That's the C. But then I go to the P. That's problem solving. Now, when we're dealing with problem solving, we're dealing with the algorithms, the problems that you solve in chemistry. But I also incorporate a lot of lateral thinking and multiple thinking levels, all kinds of different problem solving. And then the R, that's the relevance. Well, let's look at an activity that I might do in my classroom. Put this bowl over here, and I'll put this here, and I'll put this on top. So, what do we have? We've got a bowl right here. Let me do this. And I'll just take this and pour some water. Okay? Now, it's important to have students go through the nature of science. Think about how in the world could that happen? Well, you know, that's not too difficult. He had a metal container. It had water in it, and he poured it. But for some of you that really didn't see what's going on, let me repeat that for you, okay? I took the bowl like this, and I just came over, and I poured some water out, okay? There. Just to make sure there, okay? That's all I did. I came over and got the container, just like I showed. It contained some water. I poured it out. Now, I'm doing this as a continuous routine. How would I do this in my classroom? I would have another gas topic that I'm talking about and I'd talk about those concepts, and then every so often, I'd come back up to this little bowl where, just as I said, I'd come up and take it and pour some water out. There, that's all there is to it. Then I'd go back to the topic again, and I'd talk about it and just see what they're talking about. And about this time, you have students, you know, they have that puzzled look. And once again, that's what you want. You've got them thinking, and they're thinking about how in the world could that happen? How could he take a bowl and he just takes this and goes up and pours some water into it? That's all there is to it. I do this multiple times in a classroom and then I stop. I don't explain it. And then I say, guess what your homework is for the night? You have to explain this. The container where I just took this and you came up and it just poured some water. This is amazing. I always take this with me when I go on desert trips, okay? I never run out of water, okay? But it's amazing the types of students you have. I have three types of students for this type of activity. The first type, they're going to try to build it, and they're going to construct something to see if it works. Who cares if it matches up completely to what I've got as long as it explains what they saw? The first type will build it. The second type will draw it. And I'm sure you've got students like the third type where they won't do the assignment, right? They didn't do anything where you took the container and just emptied it and poured some water in there, okay? And so we'd have a discussion. How in the world could they do this? And most people will say, it's a double-walled container, or it's a trick. Well, it is a trick. It's called a lot of bowl, but it's Real interesting to pull in the history that they have traced, not spun metal types, but they have traced clay lava bowls back almost 2,000 years. That this concept, this process was being used over 2,000 years ago where you could take this and pour out water. Now, the observant person has noted that there's less water each and every time. In case you have students that are into small scale, you could do a small scale version. Or if you have students that really need to see it again and again and again and again, they could use the large size. This will pour over 100 times. But let's look at it. The student says it's a double-walled container, and that's part of the explanation. If they would come with that, it would work the first or possibly second time. As I go over to the easel, we can now see how a lot of bowl is constructed. I'll cover this part up right now. Ooh, there is a double-walled scenario. It does work, but first or second time only. You have to recognize that there is an outside hole, too. You have to have an outside hole to equilibrate pressure. You have to. If you did not have that outside vent, the water level would fall after you pour it, but you'd start getting a vapor lock. 
Now all of a sudden you've got connections where you can talk about vapor locks and automobiles or other scenarios. But with this vent, what I could do is, and I don't know if you'll be able to zoom in, I'll just quickly, but there's the outside hole. And what I did is, were you able to get it? I just reached over here and put my finger on the outside hole to keep a sealed system and I poured water and that let all the water that was on the inside of the container. And there is a little hole at the bottom to let the outside water on the outside container in to the inner container. Doesn't do much, but then once I set it down and take my finger off, the water that's on the outside will then equilibrate levels, they'll equalize, and now I have more water, and I can go back with my finger on the hole and pour this. Flynn sells this, and it is a nice activity, especially if you carry it around to develop problem solving and thinking with your students.